Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm Andy Leach, the Senior Director of Museum and Archival Collections here at the Rock Hall in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm very excited to host this interview with our special guests today, all of whom have been great friends to the Rock Hall for many years now. To celebrate his birthday, October 18th, today we're going to talk about Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Chuck Berry and especially explore his time in St. Louis, Missouri and the relationship he had with that city. Uh, and that is the focus of a new exhibit we opened here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame earlier this year. And that's called From School Days to Blueberry Hill, Chuck Berry in St. Louis. Um, I personally grew up in St. Louis or grew up near St. Louis, just on the other side of the Mississippi River in Illinois. And uh, as a guitar player who discovered Chuck Berry as a kid and uh, trying to figure out his guitar style like thousands of others have over the years, uh, I personally love this topic of Chuck Berry in St. Louis. And I'm really proud of of this exhibit that we have here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Thrilled to be doing this interview too. So Chuck Berry was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1986 as our very first inductee. And he is undeniably one of the kings of rock and roll and one of its key architects. He put all the essential pieces of rock and roll together. He was a brilliant songwriter. He practically invented rock guitar playing. And he had uh, a really incredible showmanship with a stage act and moves that were entirely unique. He created the blueprint for rock and roll and all the music that came after it uh, with all of that. And um, he also strove to bring people together with, with his music and in other ways that we're gonna talk about today. So we have a distinguished group of gentlemen here today, all of whom were very close to Chuck Berry and they knew him uh, for many decades. First, we have Charles Berry Jr. who's the son of Chuck Berry and was a guitarist in his dad's band from 2001 until Chuck's final show in October 2014. And Charles is a lifelong resident of St. Louis. He's worked as an information, information technology consultant for over 20 years. Uh, and I also should say he officially goes by Charles Berry Jr., but his friends call him Butch. So that's the name you might hear uh, some of us calling him throughout the interview. So um, we're, we're thankful to have Charles Berry Jr. with us. We also have Joe Edwards, who's the owner of Blueberry Hill a landmark music club and restaurant in St. Louis that's filled with pop culture memorabilia, all personally you know, curated by Joe himself. Blueberry Hill is a fabulous place to visit when you're in St. Louis. I highly recommend it. Joe is also a longtime close friend of Chuck Berry who performed 209 concerts in Blueberry Hill's legendary Duck Room. And uh, Joe also founded the nonprofit St. Louis Walk of Fame, which we hopefully will talk about as well. And then we also have the great Jimmy Marsala, who served as the bass player and eventually band leader for Chuck Berry for over 40 years, starting in 1973 and playing with him until their final show in October of 2014. Jimmy toured all over the world with Chuck, starting, starting with their first overseas tour in 1979. And Jimmy and Chuck were very close friends for all those years. I also want to mention that Jimmy is also the author of the book, Memories of Chuck, which I have here, uh, which is a lot of fun to read and filled with uh, stories about their work together and their great friendship. So I want to thank all of them for being here. So let's bring them out. Thanks, guys, for being here and, and doing this interview with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, to kick things off, um, I'd, I'd like to maybe start by hearing uh, from each of you briefly about just how you got to know Chuck and maybe your first memory of meeting him. Uh, Butch, uh, I'll start with you. Just, you know, being his son, you knew him the longest of everyone here. Uh, could you start by just talking about whether you might have a memory of when you first realized that your dad was this massively important figure in American music? Well, Andy, uh, you know, I grew up on in, in the city and just had neighbors like everyone does. And, you know, my dad was gone a lot. And I was like, oh, well, you, you know, he has to travel. That's the type of job he does. Uh, I knew he was a musician, but I didn't quite understand the uh, scope of what that meant um, until he came on television. I don't remember if it was, not, it wasn't Ed, so it was one of the, maybe American Bandstand, one of the shows. And, you know, I thought to myself then, it's like, well, none of my friends come on television. I, parents, that is, are on TV. Uh, about the only person I ever see on television is Walter Cronkite. And, you know, he's a pretty big wheel. So it's the president. 
Uh, so it was the mayor of St. Louis, those types. So to see my dad performing uh, on a, you know, a, on a music show was like, you no, know, there's, some, there's something distinct about what he's doing that, that I don't quite understand, but he's obviously not just the typical Joe. I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, Jake. The, the, the typical person that uh, would that would do a typical job. Yeah, right. And and I want to also um, hear from from Joe next about how he got to know Chuck. But I, I first want to mention um, I should have mentioned it at the beginning that you all are joining us from the Duck Room there at Blueberry Hill in St. Louis, where Chuck you know, played those 209 shows in those final 18 years of his performing life. So I want to, first of all, thank Joe for uh, for hosting us today from St. Louis. Um, but also, Joe, if you could also just talk about the first time you maybe remember meeting Chuck and how you got to know him. The first time I met him in person was in the 1960s after a concert in a small venue, a, a high school gym, and just as a fan went up and said, great show. And then it wasn't until the early 1980s where I really got to meet him and know him in a meaningful way. I started a beer called Rock and Roll Beer in the 19, early 1980s. And it was important to me when I started the Heroes of Rock and Roll series of cans to have Chuck Berry be the first person on a can. And, and we w worked out a deal and the friendship began because what I offered him, because he knew I didn't have a lot of money at the time, but I offered him the equivalent of what Coca-Cola might have offered him to do a similar thing. And then it, it, that just kind of wowed him. And it's just like, wow, so this guy is an honest person. And little by little, we got to know each other and, and trust each other and then started going out to concerts and different places and all. Um, and, and the friendship and the trust began. He, he didn't trust a lot of people outside of his own family. And, and it was amazing how that trust built up. He always honored what he said he was going to do. And I always honored what I said I was going to do. And I think that's where, where it started. We were different people in certain ways, like he didn't drink. And I like to have a beverage now and then. <laughs> um, but we did cut our own grass. He cut his own grass with a huge tractor trailer. I cut mine with this push mower. Um, but that, that's, it's just, it was remarkable how the trust began and, and the fascinating friendship. He he's a brilliant, was a brilliant person. And, and if he had not been a great musician, superstar, he would have been a great comedian because his command of the English language just was fun and unparalleled. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Jimmy, uh, can you talk about when you first met Chuck and then started working with him? Oh, I first was playing in a band in St. Louis. And uh, we, Jack used that band as a backup band sometimes. And we got to talking together, and, and uh, we both got kind of a weird sense of humor, so things went pretty good. And he took a liking to me, and then, then when Billy, our, our band leader, went to uh, Rod Stewart's band, Chuck asked me to stay with him, so I just, hey, hey, you're darn right I will. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it was kind of fun. So that's how I started with him. That's great. Um, and um, and there's this is a photo of you guys um, on the uh, which is on the cover of your book, which is uh, Memories of Chuck, which I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> I wanted to um, to to talk about kind of his relationship with St. Louis. Um, his names were obviously full of of names of cities throughout America and all these places he traveled, of course. Um, but he always stayed really deeply tied to the city of St. Louis and, and lived there his entire life. Um, and, and as we've talked about, he could have lived anywhere, you know, like he, he really, um, after he became famous and, and well off, he really could have lived anywhere, but he stayed in St. Louis and seemed to love the city. Could, could you, any of you talk about kind of why you think he stayed in St. Louis over the years? Sure. Uh, well, you know, of course my dad's mother, father, sisters, and brothers were here in St. Louis. Uh, and he just loved St. Louis, you know, really, he truly loved this city. Um, you know, my parents had some, well, my mom, the, the state still has a farmland out in Wentzville. And my dad created this place. It was called Berry Park. It was a kind of a pseudo amusement park resort type deal. And that was his refuge. Uh, he absolutely loved being out there. Joe just mentioned the, uh, 
you know, that my dad cut his grass. He really did cut the grass and he did use, uh, you know, uh, farm tractors to do that job. He, he enjoyed doing it. He really just relished us having that time uh, to do that type of stuff. And as outgoing as my dad, the persona of him being really outgoing and, you know, an extrovert, I think my dad was a it was kind of, I don't, I don't want to go so far as say reclusive, but, but a bit reserved, where he liked to spend the time where he could he could be in his own environment and just enjoy himself. Um, I mean, and then there was the other thing. Um, he, you know, so he had Barry Park, uh, had a house in, in the city, and he had houses in Las Vegas and in, in Hollywood, but the majority of his time was spent right here in St. Louis, the vast majority of his time. So he could call Jimmy up and say, hey man, what you doing today? Oh, I'm not doing anything, Chuck. And then next thing you know, they're cutting down trees out of Berry Park. So <laughs> that that was truly his form of relaxation. It was just just chilling out and, and just hanging out with his friends. We cut down a lot of trees out there. <laughs> and we cut them up and use them for firewood too. Right. So, but we kept the place pretty clean and uh, I got to eat and cutting the grass, I got to use a small tractor going around the edges. But that's what I did. <laughs> And and Jimmy uh, or Joe, did did Chuck talk to you guys about St. Louis in, 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 much, or did he talk about uh, how much he liked the city or why he why he decided to, to live there? Oh, uh, he did. We 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 spent spent many nights over at my house at his house, just talking about the early days of his career and his family and all. And his family meant everything to Chuck Berry. And he was not going to leave St. Louis. He, most most musicians do. They leave, go to Las Vegas, L.A., New York, Nashville, whatever. But uh, his his family was here, and that meant more to him than anything. And he his goal in life was to support his family. And that's when he got so uh, intense about financial relationships with promoters and all that. He wanted to make sure he got paid so then he could take care of them. And he never wanted to leave St. Louis, and, and he, he really loved it. It, it, it was, it was a, a great relationship. And he was the first person inducted in the nonprofit St. Louis Walk of Fame, the same way he was the first person inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's how great he was musically, but his heart was still here in St. Louis. And he also told me that the, uh, he enjoyed playing the smaller venues and the more intimate venues. He enjoyed that a lot. That's great. Well, I know he, um, you know, he grew up um, in, a, in a historic African-American neighborhood in the north part of St. Louis called the Ville. Um, could any of you tell us about the Ville, especially in that era when when Chuck was growing up there and maybe what it meant to him? Well, uh, Andy, as you said, yeah, so he lived in the segregated area that was designated for blacks uh, called the Ville. And it was, what, 15 by 15 blocks, something like that. And so that's, you know, he's born in 1926. That's where he, he was born. That's where he was raised. And amazingly, uh, it was fairly self-sufficient. So it had its own hospital. It had its own high school, its own middle school or middle school and then various uh, elementary schools that were just scattered around in that area. So it was fairly self-contained and, you know, you, you grow, you understand and adapt to the environment that you're in. So, you know, to go to, to, to the church he went to, which was also in, uh, in the Ville, the Antioch, uh, he was, it was just right, not that far, you know, within walking distance from where they lived. So it goes back to what uh, Jimmy and, and Joe said, you know, he just truly loved this city and he had every intention of staying here. Um, he kept his parents' house for the longest until after both of them passed away uh, because they wanted to keep it in the family. They, you know, it, it, they basically, the, the, the brothers and sisters made a vow that they would keep the parents' family, the parents' house in the ville in the family 
uh, as long as possible. And they eventually, unfortunately, you know, they, they did uh, have to turn it over. But there was just a unique experience for my father and those that lived in the Ville, uh, the camaraderie, the, you know, everyone knows everyone else. I'm talking, you know, there's what, what, 30,000 people, maybe 40,000 people in that area, but everybody knew everyone because everyone went to Sumner High School, you know, at some point, unless they left the city altogether. So it, um, you know, the environment was conducive to uh, relationships, relationships that he held for his life with his friends that he, uh, that he grew up with. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Sumner. Um, around, I think starting around 1940 or so, he started attending Sumner High School, which it's, um, from what I understand, was the first African-American high school west of the Mississippi River. Um, right. Lots of famous alumni there over the years, including Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Tina Turner and many other musicians and actors and uh, and people like that. Um, could, could you kind of speculate on kind of maybe how Sumner shaped uh, his his life and his career uh, after that? Well, Dan, <clears throat> Sumner had a um, had an excellent principal. He was not taking any gruff off of any of the students. My dad was a bit of a rabble rouser. I mean, this, <laughs> he was. But uh, at the same time, uh, Sumner was a, you know, it was also very nurturing. Uh, all his friends went to Sumner High School, all of them. And it goes back to that, you know, neighborhood environment. All of them were trying to strive to do one thing or another. There were, um, so Sumner was adjacent to uh, Homer G. Phillips Hi uh, Hospital. And a vast number of students that went to Sumner went on to medical school outside of St. Louis, or some here in St. Louis or Wash U, and became doctors at that very hospital. You know, uh, it goes back to like I, I said about the, the street that I grew up on, uh, Windermere Place. Um, I still am in touch with all of those kids. Well, now adults. Uh, and that's the same thing with Sumner. You know, you, you get a group of friends, especially in high school, because, you know, that's your formative years. You're still developing how to be uh, how to interact with other people and everybody just fell in. Now, Miss Turner, she came after my dad, uh, as did Arthur Ashe, but I'll go back to a lot of those doctors. They went to Sumner High School. In fact, my closest friend to this day, his dad was a close friend with my father. <laughs> and in fact, I saw him earlier today. You know, and so that, that, those types of relationships were just, just pretty much inevitable just because of the environment they all were in. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, well, kind of moving forward a few years, you know, starting in uh, the late 40s and getting into the early 50s, um, Chuck was starting to perform music around um, St. Louis in and around the city. Uh, and in particular, I know one important club in those days was the Cosmopolitan in East St. Louis, um, yes. which is on the other side of the river in Illinois. Um, and of course, he's, he also teams up with uh, Johnny Johnson, the great boogie woogie piano player. Uh, they have a trio. And um, I'm wondering, you know, for any of you, what, what do you think, um, how do you think being from St. Louis or being from that part of the country even um, helped shape Chuck's musical tastes and, and his musical development? The cool thing about St. Louis in those years was not only where we're the gateway to the West, the whole East to West migration, but the whole Southern or South to North migration was occurring too. And people of all economic backgrounds, all racial backgrounds, all musical, literary backgrounds came together on their way to Chicago or Memphis, wherever it might be. And, and, um, and all these, you know, different influences collided and the result was an explosion of creativity. So Chuck Berry's music was very influenced by country, for example, that he called hillbilly music and all, because he listened to that on the radio too, in addition to blues like Money Waters and, and Hall and & Wolf and all. And uh, it, 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 an amazing city. Uh, other cities have their their one name thing, like, you know, New Orleans jazz, you know, 
Chicago blues, Memphis might be soul or whatever it might be. Um, and we have all the, have all those and because of those influences and that influenced uh, Chuck Berry in a major way. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree about the country music influence, which kind of makes him um, maybe uh, different from that that other kind of um, group of, of rock and roll pioneers from that era. With I think he definitely had this real country music influence that's in there. It's, it's of course, part of Maybelline. It's built into to the song, right? Well, well, Andy, you know, you have to take consideration, and Joe alluded to this, but basically it was country music and classical music and really not that much classical. It was really country music and then church and then uh, religious stations in the city mm -hmm. when my dad was coming up. Now, on good nights, you could get WDIA out of, was that West Memphis or wherever it was. So that's where, you know, you would get the opportunity to listen to all the blues, you know, because B.B. King was on that on that radio station, as were other uh, uh, artists. But so you hear that, you then you you fold that in with country, and then also the gospel that you know my grandmother and grandfather were very religious. My grandfather was a uh, a deacon at Antioch, and you know you hear those those types of music, and I'll go back to what I said earlier. You know your environment influences you so you're hearing you know hank williams or uh bob wills and the texas playboys which is really a great band i still like them yeah. uh, and then you start hearing uh t-bone walker and uh you know lewis jordan and you know all the big bands you know because as 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 strange as it may seem that's what they were listening to then, all the, you know, all the big bands. And so they, you know, I have to include them also uh, in that mix that was on the radio. And so that's where, you know, that's where all the, the roots of what my dad developed into his style came from. It's just that melding of different uh, types of music. One other thing I like to point out too is um, when Chuck Berry watched television and saw Nat King Cole on national television, a black man on a national television show for a couple of years and all. And, and he, he was just in awe of his diction. And he realized, wow, um, the blues players are more, you know, they, they're kind of rough around the edges and all. But Nat King Cole made it on to where he could, Chuck Berry felt he could expose himself to all sorts of uh, other fans around the country and the world if he used that Nat King Cole clear, crisp diction. And, and he did all the time. So much so that after Maybelline came out, as you say, in, in 1955, and he started touring down south and all, people didn't realize that he was African-American, that a lot of the clubs had booked him. And they were shocked when he walked in and said, um, you know, who are you? Well, I'm Chuck Berry. I'm playing here tonight. Well, no, you can't be Chuck Berry. And then they realized he really was. And and um, and the fans he brought together, black and white and all backgrounds, was amazing. He, he did more to join the teenagers who were more open to integration and, and dealing with each other, having fun with each other, singing and dancing at the concerts and all. So eventually, the, the chord that went down on the black side of the concert and the white side of the concert, that finally got broken down in large part to him and, and some others too. But Chuck Berry, I think, did it more than anybody around the world. Well, speaking about the diversity of the music here, uh, I grew up in the, well, I started in the 40s. I was born in 41. And in the 40s, I was listening to uh, little Jimmy Dickens and, and Hank Williams and guys like that. And then eventually, in St. Louis, people migrated north, and then you got uh, Ike Turner, BB <laughs> or not BB King, but Albert King, Albert. and Little Milton all played here in St. Louis at the same time. And I used to listen to them on KETZ sixteen hundred run the radio. I listened to them going to sleep while I was going to high school, and uh, then I got for house parties and that we listened to Chuck Berry and the contemporary music at that time. And, Boy, it was it was it was amazing all the different types of music that came up here 
Yeah, it was incredible. Great. Go ahead. No, I just a great music scene at that time. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and Joe, and, you know, since you mentioned sort of um, his clear diction, which he, you know, was influenced by um, Nat King Cole, I, I wanted to bring up another thing I remember um, that I've read over the years, which is that, um, and this is an important person to recognize too, is um, is Chuck's wife, Thameta, who um, I, from what I understand, really um, gave him a lot of good music advice as well as kind of, you know, um, being his wife and and kind of raising his family. Um, I know, um, I think uh, what I had read was that she kind of was able to advise him kind of on how to speak to a white audience and, and, um, and just give him advice about kind of racial tactics, I guess, on stage. Does that sound right to you, Butch? Well, yeah, to a, yeah, for the most part. I mean, you know, so mom was from Mississippi mm -hmm. and there was a very structured environment. I've, I've been using the word environment quite a bit. So um, the thing with mom was, whereas dad was, you know, when he was a little boy, it was primarily country and Western and uh, gospel music. Um, and maybe some, and you know, big band stuff where my mother was from in Hollis Springs, Mississippi, it was strictly, blue, you know, straight up blues. I mean, Memphis, many type blues. I know she really liked Holland Wolf. <laughs> in Holland Wolf, you know, later on, yeah. So she was a huge blues fan. Hmm. And, uh, you know, so she saw that my dad had taken up a, uh, a fondness of playing guitar. She says, you know, you're pretty good at that. You, you should try and push, you know, push yourself with that. And so she was, she too was, you know, steering him towards, hey, play, play this type of music. Or what do you think of this? Or, you know, what do you think of that? Oh, yeah, mom? Yeah, no question. Major influence in, in what turned out to be my dad's career. Sure. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, he he starts really hitting it big, like we said, with Maybelline uh, in 1955. That's his first massive hit. Um, and then, you know, he has just signed with Chess Records in Chicago. And this really just kicks off an incredible run of dozens of rock and roll classics um, that were revolutionary at the time and changed popular music forever. Um, from Roller Beethoven to Johnny B. Good, School Day. Um, could could any of you kind of just mention your maybe your song you think should be uh, deserves a mention, a real song you really love from that period? There, there, there are so many. It's unbelievable. He he has has more, you know, brilliant classics. I think than most other musicians or groups for that matter. Uh, Johnny B. Good is the most famous one, probably, because, among other things, it's on the Voyager space probes mm -hmm. that NASA launched in 1977, I think, and it's way out of, our, out of our solar system now as an example if other life forms are out there in other universes that they can find out what music was like um, in our little planet called Earth. And that that, that was a huge honor in, in, in all. Um, but, but there's so many, and, and the fact that People can hear titles of different supergroups or superstars, but I don't know of anybody other than Chuck Berry that the, the phrase "Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll" it was a phrase in the song "School Day," and and that's just as big as any song title. So that's that shows how much power his songwriting and 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 performing, you know, brought out to the universe. We also played a contract or a, a concert at the. Uh, APL Laboratories, I believe it was, that uh, made the uh, uh, Voyager, uh, and we played a concert on the time that the Voyager was leaving our solar system, and I uh, got to meet Carl Sagan there at the time. It, it was pretty cool. Wow. You know, um, I think we even have an image of that um, that golden record. Um, John, I believe it's, yes, it's uh, this one. So for folks who haven't heard this, uh, yeah, Carl Sagan helped put this this uh, album, this compilation together, containing a bunch of sounds from around the world uh, to kind of show off some of our greatest musical works, but other sounds too. But uh, so Bach and Stravinsky, and of course, I think the only, maybe the only popular music or maybe the only rock and roll uh, artist 
uh, included is Chuck Berry, and it's Johnny B. Good, as as Joe said, right? Yes, right. I believe that is correct. <laughs> There's a lot of things saying about the uh, aliens. We're saying send more Chuck Berry. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Martin had a great Saturday Night Live, live skit that way, where he, you know, when some aliens did find the the space probe, and then he holds up a sign saying, send more Chuck Berry. That was their response to Earth. <laughs> That's right. That's great. Um, and, um, you know, just kind of uh, thinking about this period, I mean, he's, he's incredibly successful. Uh, but like we said, he's, he settles down in St. Louis and, and um, even um, kind of gets a, moves into a nicer home, as, um, as Butch was talking about. And then... Um, and I think this this is this the one on uh, on Windermere that we're looking at. Yes, I still look okay. <laughs> and and Butch, maybe um, could you talk about kind of how um, I've heard various people say that Chuck so, so Chuck Berry was the rock and roll star, while Charles Edward Anderson Berry was the real guy or the real man, you know who, um, and he was really and Chuck Berry is almost like this role that he played when he was on stage. Did did it feel like that? to you at the time? Uh, yeah, you know, because, uh, and I think these guys would vouch for it. You know, there was Chuck Berry, the, you know, the uh, flamboyant, flashy guy on stage. But when he got off stage, he was just these two guys' good friend. You know, like I said, you know, Jimmy, they, I, we're not pulling, you know, pulling your leg. They really did go cut trees down at that 170 some odd acre uh, plot of land. They really did just, Go and you know, Jimmy would come over with his wife, or you know, or by himself, and they'd watch Cardinals baseball. You know, these guys—he really was. It was just Charles, or I mean, these guys called him Chuck, but it, that. So okay, perfect way of putting it. There's Alice Cooper, and then there's Vincent Fern, was it Farnier? You know, there's two different people, and Alice even said at one point he kind of. He, he kind of blurred the two. My dad never made, never blurred those two. He was always Chuck Berry on stage, and he was always dad at home, or he was always these guys' friends, Chuck. You know that he just, hey, hey, what are you doing? Let's just go hang out. Or after the show uh, here at Blueberry Hill, Joe, uh, I'm going to get those wings and I'm out. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, yeah, there was two distinct, two distinct people. Or we'd go to the casino together. <laughs> or that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I know he, he was always um, continually pushing boundaries um, in musically, of course, but also um, kind of breaking down barriers there in the city. Um, I think it's 1958 when he opened Club Bandstand, which I yes. think was on Grand Avenue. Yes. And it sounds like that was a music club where the idea was that fans of different races, um, different backgrounds could gather uh, could could any of you tell us a little bit about Club Bandstand? What you guys want to take? That was before my time. <laughs> it, it, it was it was a, a brilliant move on his part, and and it was purposely to invite people of all races, as you said there, and that did not go over well mm -hmm. with the white male establishment in St. Louis and all the big places on Grand Avenue, like the big movie theaters, like the Fox Theater where he was turned away as a young kid because he was black, he couldn't go in, which made it all the more wonderful when Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll, the movie that Taylor Hackford, the director, directed, where he could go back and drive his red Cadillac out on stage and, and be the star where he was turned away. But it, it's, it, they did everything they could to get rid of this mixed race club. And they, they succeeded eventually in, in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it was, yeah, a really bold step, I think, especially for an African-American, uh, not just a famous person, but any African-American person in the fifties to do something like that, to challenge racism, bringing people together. Um, and, and around the same time, maybe it's a little, a little after around the same time, he purchases um, the land that we talked about earlier that turns yes. into Berry Park. Um, yes. And um, I think you you talked about this a little bit, um, Butch. But what was that the same idea behind Barry Park was to sort of create this space where people could gather together? Absolutely. Uh, and you know he 
early on, he managed to actually achieve that goal. Um, so on Buckner Road, where uh, Barry Park is, uh, um, you would turn in and you could, you could fish, you could hunt, uh, you could uh, ride horses, you could do basically anything, any kind of le leisure type deal um, that you wanted. You know, there were many bikes, but those were ours. So the other kids is like, hey, get off my mini bike. But, uh, you know, there was a club there uh, and th he would have parties there, you know, over the weekends from the 50s until the 70s. Um, and it was tremendous. It was, it, as a family member, it was Nirvana. We would go out to Berry Park and just have absolute fun. You know, city kids getting to go out and just go wander out into the, into the forest or fish for the day or, uh, you know, watch my cousins as they, they hunted the squirrels or what have you. Uh, man, you talk about having fun. And especially, and, and, but, but now, Andy, the one place that uh, really solidified things were well, two places. One was the swimming pool, and then the other was the club. Because the swimming pool, you it'd be anybody, anybody and everybody. Everybody wanted to, to uh, swim in the guitar-shaped pool. And then later on the evening, in the evening, the adults would go and uh, spend an evening at the club. And in many cases, my dad uh you know they would perform there or they would have you know local acts come in and do their thing it was it was it was very successful but at the same time uh this is rural uh missouri at the time uh and many of the same dynamics that took place in the city took place out there so the cops would come and raid them hey yeah da, da, da. um but then <laughs> Uh, some of the police would say, man, I don't know why I'm coming out here, Chuck, you know, uh, they, my, my, uh, the chief's an idiot, but, you know, we got to shut you down for the night. But he kept right on, he kept right on going. He kept right on going. And, and till it closed, it was super fun. But I think one of the things that influenced uh, Chuck about Barry Park was in France, every weekend, everybody's got their campers and going to these little parks like this yeah. and they're camping out for the weekend. And I think Chuck got, got uh, influenced by that. And I think he was the first person in the world to build a guitar shaped swimming pool <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to mention this briefly and you, you, you alluded to it, Butch about, you know, the authorities, it, you know, throughout a lot of his career kind of had had it out for him. It seemed like they wanted to get him. Um, and I I think part of that was that he was flaunting success and bringing black and white audiences together. Um, and um, I, I, do, I do think a lot of those I mean, and you can um, you can tell me what you think, too. But the it seems like arrests that happened with him could, wouldn't probably wouldn't have happened to a white person. Right. Probably not, but I'm not going to eliminate that totally because, you know, you, you are dealing with, uh, you know, people are envious. When someone becomes successful, uh, regardless of skin color, uh, they're going to be envious people that want to, you know, put the kibosh on something like that. Now, once again, we're all talking back in the 50s and, you know, there were some fairly obvious and uh, defined lines in regards to the, to the races, but as time progressed, you know, those barriers start to drop. Um, it got to the point where the police, the, you know, the, the police in the area, they would just come out just like anybody else, just to hang out in Barry Park. You know, so early on, oh no, this guy's not going to have this. And then later on, it was like, hey, well, Chuck, can, hey, we're going to come out and fish. Okay, good. Come on. You know, no hard feelings. Just come on, let's do it. Well, when I was a, when I was a teenager, there were black clubs in St. Louis and there were white clubs. Mm -hmm. And when the, the white kids would later go over to the east side and mingle, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they'd always go over to the east side because the, the drinking age was lower mm -hmm. and, and they stayed open later. Right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, as as we kind of get into the 60s and 70s, um, obviously, um, you know, he's, Chuck still lived in St. Louis, but he was touring all over the country um, and famously always kind of often playing with pickup bands who would be hired by promoters. And then there wasn't a lot of rehe- maybe there's no rehearsing most of the time, um, not no set list. Um, a lot of funny stories about that over the years. Um, I know that kind of and and Butch alluded to it earlier. He started getting this reputation around this time for being a little bit difficult. But I think um, Jimmy, you addressed this in your book that that reputation was probably kind of a one sided story, right? Like, uh, oh, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Can I mean, you talk about how that came about? Well, you know. When he first started out, you would get paid after the show, and sometimes the promoter wasn't around after the show, so you you didn't get paid. So that's that's how come he started the pay me first. Then I'll go on. And then, of course, he wanted certain equipment, and, and he required certain equipment to get his sound. And if he didn't get his sound, he didn't want to play, had, unless he got compensation for that. So he would fine him for having the wrong equipment. And of course, you know, the promoter's not going to say that uh, he was great and he did everything right. And Chuck was a jerk. It's, it's simple. It's, <laughs> he, he's not going to blame himself. He's going to blame Chuck for his uh, inability to, to uh, adhere to the contract. Right. Yeah. I mean, my dad's contract was probably the most straightforward in the business. And simple and simple. He didn't ask for much. Yeah. Here's when I'm coming. This is how long I'm playing. This is how much I want. This is my lodging. This is my uh, equipment. Know, the equipment, and this is the kind of car I want. And no, nothing more, nothing less. I'm going to do everything exactly to the letter. That you've got to do the same thing. And to go back to something Jimmy uh, made the comment about about how Dad uh, say, "Hey, you got to pay me first. Although. Myth has it that was something that just my dad do. Oh no no no! Any any musician that has been around for a while, they've already been paid before they even leave their house. At this point in the game, you know, as as he progresses in stature, yeah. When you when you're just a band starting off, you can't dictate the terms. But once you you become uh, someone that people want to see, then you get to do that. And so his terms are right here on this piece of, on the paper. Just follow them, follow the terms. We're not going to have any problems. You yeah, don't me, follow the terms. Well, we're going to have an issue. He didn't ask for much, but he insisted on everything he asked for. Right. Including. And, oh, go ahead, Jeff. And all they had to do, as they both said, was follow those terms. There was a promoter, I think, in Chicago one time, a nice promoter, that um, and, and Chuck flew in, and they were at the airport waiting to go to the concert, and Chuck just stood there, you know, minute after minute, half hour after half hour, and the promoter, as nice as he was, came up, Mr. Barry, you know, we're getting close to showtime. You really need to get in the, in the, the limo and go to the show. And he said, well, no, I didn't call for a limo. In my contract, I want a rental car. I'd like to be able to drive myself. I can come and go as I please when I want to, to go and not feel constrained. And the promoter thought he was doing a favor. and and uh, But he stood, he stood by it, and, and the promoter had to find the rental, whether it's a Lincoln or Cadillac rental car, town car to, to drive. And somehow he found one late at night, and they went on, and, and the show came off. Um, but that just shows all they have to do is follow the directions that they agreed to. Right. And it has to, it has to be a rental car, not a personal car, right. because even if it's a personal car of the same type, those cars usually disappear after the show. Right. <laughs> and, and, and Jimmy can attest to that fact. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, oh yeah. Uh, we got in a lot of cabs. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, one, one, one story in particular where um, they were in, what, in Sweden, with, when you met Thomas, was that in Sweden or in? Oh, that was in Denmark. In Denmark. Yeah. So um, uh, they, I wasn't in the band yet, but uh, my dad and Jimmy, they do the show. They come outside. The promoter has taken off with the car, and someone that has become a very beloved friend of my family and Jimmy's family, uh, Thomas, 
He drove them from wherever this place was, 40, 50 miles back to the airport. And it just proves the point and the reasons why my dad was like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to have my car. I'm going to keep the keys. I do not want a driver. None of that. Just give me the keys. Give me a map. And I'll be there. We will be there on time, ready to play. We will we will do a knock your socks off performance. We'll, you know, do meets and greets, sign some autographs, and then we're gonna burn out. And that's that was just that's just how he rolled, you know. He, and it's you he he learned as he went along. And something that I I understand quite well is like, no, 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 there's still going to be some people that are going to try and swindle you. So you've got to beat them to the punch to make sure that you don't get swindled and they don't feel that they've been swindled. Another thing about that show was that car was a chauffeur car and the chauffeur, he had to watch Chuck drive it away. <laughs> that was kind of funny. <laughs> and Jimmy, you know, talk about um, joining Chuck's band um, in 1973 and kind of, your role in that band and how you fit in? Uh, actually, in that role in the band, is I was just a bass player. <laughs> and uh, when I started playing, we, we, we played his songs all the time. That's why he used that band as a backup band. And uh, so when we started playing, I started playing what I played with the, the other band. And Chuck came over to me and says, hey, can you play this figure? And he did this figure on a guitar. He wanted me to play on a bass. So I did that. And the second song, I started playing just like I played with the other band. He came over and he says, uh, can you play this figure? <laughs> Hit that figure again. I said, I got it. And that I played that figure again until he told me to stop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I was wondering about that, too. When, when you would play his songs from the 50s, would he have you playing exactly like, say, what Willie Dixon would have played on those? On those no, 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 okay. no, no. I had a certain pattern I played. And that oh. was it. It made him feel comfortable, and that's what I played. And, uh, Go ahead, Jimmy. And, and when when I first started with Chuck, when I after uh, I was after Billy went with uh, Rod Stewart, when I became the band leader, I would talk to the band, the members that were provided for us, and I would give them signs with my hands to tell them what key we were playing in when Chuck did his intro, because we stayed out of the intro. We didn't come in until number one of the fifth bar, which musicians don't understand what I'm saying there. And uh, I would flash the key sign to the keyboard player so he knew what key we were playing in. And I would do starts and stops by body body figures, way, way I turn my body and let the drummer know when to stop, do a break and when to start and, and that kind of stuff. Hmm. But And uh, once, once he started taking the uh, Blueberry Hill Band, I didn't have to do that anymore. So yeah, the, we knew what to do out this. So when, sometimes we didn't do a, a sound check. So I do a five minute talk with the band and tell them about what we do. We did the first three songs usually were the same. And then from then on out, it was whatever came to Chuck's mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would tell them what we were going to do and just be comfortable and look for my signs and I'll guide you right through it. That's what I, what I did. Do mm -hmm. you still remember the signs for each key? Oh, yeah. Uh, pointing to the ground, it started with G, so that was G. Uh -huh. Then E was three fingers, looked like an E. C was like this. E flat was two fingers up. I don't know why. I don't, I don't, I don't know what significance that is. And B flat, I would just mouth, B flat. Right. You know? <laughs> That's great. And that, that was the five keys he played in. Right. Okay. And, oh. and, of course, E flat and B flat are kind of piano keys, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's that's what was another thing that uh, everybody always said. Well, Johnny Johnson helped write those songs because those were all piano keys. Well, they were big band keys, right. and Chuck was a big band guy. Right, those were right. Keys. He loved big bands. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and Chuck, right. and, and Chuck Berry also was a really good piano player. He was a great guitar player, but he was also a darn good piano player. He would come over to my house late at night and 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 just start playing the grand piano in my living room, and um. I, I don't know how he could play it because his hands were so big, but he did. And, um, and, and he wrote a lot of songs on piano and then transferred the, the notes to guitar playing. 
by the same token, I couldn't understand how Johnny could play. His hands were short and stubby. <laughs> and he played great. Yeah, he sure did. Excellent. Um, well, as we uh, kind of get into the mid-80s, um, um, Taylor Hackford's 1987 documentary, Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll, as, as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, it features two concerts that were held at the Great Fox Theater that celebrated uh, Chuck's 60th birthday. So it included... You know, if you've seen the film, and you should, everyone should go out and see the film. But it's you know, Keith Richards is the band leader, Etta James, Eric Clapton, Linda Ronstadt. Um, now, I think Butch and Joe, you were you were at the show, right? Can you talk about the, um, the maybe the the rehearsals, the kind of the whole thing, the whole filming? Well, the rehearsals were a joy for me. Um, they were held at Barry Park, and in the clubhouse that was still there at the time. And um, I would leave work in the afternoon at Blueberry Hill and like three and drive out there and stay till three in the morning. And I was the only non film related person there, but I could sit on this couch eight feet away and, and watch Chuck Berry, Robert Cray, Eric Clapton, and everybody rehearse um, Keith Richards. Uh, and, and all it was just, it was, it was just really, really enjoyable. And, then you could see the the heads budding a little bit at, at that time, even between Keith Richards and Chuck, because Chuck had his sound that he wanted, the amp at a certain place and everything else. And Keith thought, well, the sound people outside, you know, and from England in this big sound truck, you know, are saying it should be so-and-so. And um, they, so they they had a few arguments. Chuck always won. It was it was um, it was his place. He was the star. And um and Keith, I think, just thought, well, I'm Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. And it worked, I'm sure, with everybody else around the world, but it didn't work with Chuck. It, 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 he liked Keith, um, yeah, he but he, he just wouldn't, he, he just wanted to have his music done the way he wanted, and he got it. Yeah. And uh, Butch, you um, you were around for, for some of that, too. I know your sister Ingrid, I believe, is even in the film. Yes. Um, were you in the audience there at the at the Fox? Well, I too was out at uh, the rehearsals, and I was at both shows at um, at uh, the Fox. But Andy, there was one other show that uh, doesn't get much play, and of the three, my favorite, well, my absolute favorite were the rehearsals because they were, you know, it was just laid back, loose. Yeah, they were learning how to do what they were going to do, or what everybody else was, but they already knew. But uh, but the show that was at the Cosmopolitan mm -hmm. was by far mm -hmm. my personal favorite. Uh, so it goes back to what Jimmy uh, said earlier about my dad liking to do smaller venues. So, and also the reason why my father started playing here at Blueberry Hill, because he really did enjoy playing intimate, small places. I mean, my dad and Jimmy, I, I missed that one particular show, but they played in front of half a million people in Italy. But he really enjoyed playing the smaller venues because you could see everybody in the crowd. Uh, you could interact. You could, you know, someone four or five rows back, you could still see what this, you know, see them singing the words. So at the Cosmo, uh, at the time, the Cosmo Parliament had been completely run down. In fact, I think the uh, the um, the bar area was actually just used for storage. Don't quote me on that, but I believe they were no longer even having events in that space. It was basically a liquor store, but they recreated. So if I remember correctly, the, the uh, snow-capped mountains that my father had painted back in the 50s were still on one of the walls. <laughs> they come in, uh, and it was my sister, my brother-in-law, uh, my father, uh, bass player, it wasn't Jimmy, uh, and Johnny Johnson, and they destroyed that place. Because, and it goes back to, and Jimmy also made this comment, where he didn't have to say anything because it was the band. It was the, it, it, it was the people that he was very comfortable with that he all he had to do is start playing. It wasn't a matter of figuring out the keys. It wasn't a matter of figuring out the tempo. Everybody already knew it. It was incredible. And that um, that hell hell rock and roll starts at the Cosmopolitan. That very first song, that's at the yeah. Cosmopolitan. Incredible. 
Yeah, and, correct. Butch is so right. That, that was great. And the way Taylor Hackford, the director, recreated and his staff recreated the Cosmo, which is no longer there now. Right. It's already kind of deteriorating, but they, they made it like the real club was, and it yeah. was it was cool as can be. Yeah, incredible. Well, well, unfortunately, that, yeah. unfortunately, I didn't get to play on that. I was I was in L.A. at the time, Yeah, and uh, I think that uh, Keith Richards wanted his own band. I, I thought he was – I had heard that he was going to tour afterwards, and uh, he wanted his own band, hmm. and – Unfortunately, I didn't get to make that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting that you mentioned the Cosmo and him playing small clubs because it's a the perfect way to segue into talking about Blueberry Hill. And um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, you're all joining us from uh, the Duck Room there at Blueberry Hill, which is where Chuck, um, back in 90, 1996, started performing what became a legendary series of, of 209 shows. Um, there at the club and um, this is in the Del Mar Loop of St. Louis and as I mentioned um, anybody who's ever going through St. Louis you really should go check out um, Blueberry Hill. Um, Joe can you talk about how how that series of shows got started um, you know how what conversations you were having with Chuck that led to to him playing there? Well he and I were sitting around late at night one night just talking he was reminiscing about his early days his early career days and then he got to a point, he just said, you know, Joe, I'd really like to play a place the size of the ones that I played when I first started out. And we looked at each other and in a half a second, let's do it. Let's do it at Blueberry Hill. And, and that's how it started. It was it was that simple and and um, and and wonderful. And and it, it like you said, it became legendary. It's been mentioned in Rolling Stone magazine and all sorts of people came from around the world to see him from Japan, from Brazil, from England, from every place. And uh, it, it, it was it was magical. And I loved watching him interact with the crowd. Like like Butch has said, you know, he he liked these size venues. Could He could see their eyes, the, the, the fans eyes and they could see his. And he might start off, you know, and realize oh we're not clicking all the way yet and through halfway through a song and then he would turn to jimmy okay we're changing this song to a rocker and then he would look at the audience and engage them and one, once he and the band clicked then it was up to him to click with the audience and once all three entities clicked oh my gosh off to the races on one of the greatest concerts they'll ever see the people over there at those especially the early and middle years to see those concerts it was magical the only thing was he never told me. He just went to Red Head James. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, we just kind of had to figure it out. Follow me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the difference is the film, the familiarity with the people that were in the band, uh, those those changes. Oh, and he changed key. Oh, change key. They would like that. You know, it, you, you, you couldn't have a pickup band and successfully do that. You just couldn't. Because, you know, nine times out of 10, you, you've got people that are starstruck, um, that may be excellent musicians, but are still starstruck. So, you know, they're trying, they're nervous, and they're trying to not screw up. And then, wait a minute, you just went to C to B flat. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> well, I remember one night when uh, Johnny Rivers was sitting in with us, and uh, Chuck had a habit. He would just grab the guitar. He he had a he didn't believe in looking at the neck, and he grabbed the wrong key. He, he played an A, mm -hmm. and, and he never plays an A. And I I told him, hey, change the A, you know. And Johnny Rivers came over to me and said, well, he didn't play that key, and and he doesn't play that song in A. He plays the B flat. I said he's playing an A tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Johnny was, but Johnny was. Kind of a tangent here, but Johnny was. Oh, bless his heart. He was a great guy. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. Great guy. Johnny Rivers was just fantastic. Fantastic person. Um, and I'm not, I'm not speaking in the past tense. I'm just meaning he is a yeah. just fantastic guy. Um, he, whatever, you know, even when he was coming in, hey, well, well, you just tell me what you guys want me to do. I'm, I'll do it. You know, he was. Just oh, great yeah. Dude. Great, dude. great, dude. great guy. Great guy. Great. Did excellent covers of my dad's stuff. Excellent. I didn't I didn't say that to say anything bad about Johnny. He was no, a, he's a great guy. No, great guy. 
And, um, and Chuck, Berry, Chuck Berry would also, in the middle of a song, switch to a different song yeah. occasionally. And the band, <laughs> oh, yeah. because it was the Blueberry Hill Band, they could pick up on that within a couple of beats um, where other, uh, other bands couldn't. He would also sometimes just stop and recite poetry yeah. in the middle of a concert. And occasionally he would take off his guitar and play drums. Occasionally he, he would play bass and, and occasionally he would do just pretty much anything on a whim. And it was that those were exciting times. And speaking of pickup bands, years ago, a little known guy that was making it bigger and bigger called Bruce Springsteen. Um, Chuck Berry was playing a concert, I guess, in New Jersey. And the opening band was Bruce's band. And Chuck always shows up on time. He never is late. He, he might show up three hours early. And he might show up one minute before showtime. Well, this particular night, he showed up about a minute or two before showtime. And and Bruce Springsteen goes up to him and says, Mr. Berry, Mr. Berry, good to see you. Oh, what, what music were you playing tonight? Thinking he's about to get a song list. And Chuck's response was, we're playing Chuck Berry music. <laughs> Yeah, that, that narrows it down to about 50 classic tunes. So Bruce probably knew most of them, I'm sure. Um, yeah, all, all the all the bands that backed him, you know, when he traveled by himself, knew knew the songs. I, I, I don't think there's any musician during those periods that didn't, because most of them learned how to play guitar, learned how to sing or interact with an audience based on Chuck's moves and his expertise in songwriting. Well, absolutely. That was the advantage we had, but... It's just a matter of knowing when to do what, and that's what I was there for. <laughs> right, right. And you did it greatly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, fortunate to see one of those shows in uh, in 2014, actually, and um, it was it was pretty magical to, to be there in the room that you're in right now. Um, I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, too, uh, Joe founded the St. Louis Walk of Fame right there on Delmar Delmar Boulevard, which is right out in front of. Of Blueberry Hill, which celebrates all kinds of local St. Louis figures, like I think Charles Lindbergh and Maya Angelou and others. Um, and Joe, as Joe mentioned, Chuck was inducted in the first year. Um, uh, and I, I think we even have a photo of uh, Chuck's star on the Walk of Fame right here. <clears throat> and um, Joe, do you want to talk any at all about uh, the St. Louis Walk of Fame and how? how Chuck ended up in the first class? Well, it was, it was important to me to have a walk of fame that not only had a person's name and star, but had a description, a little bit of background on the person, why they're famous, whether it was in journalism or education or music or sports. And, and it takes a lot of extra effort to research and all. In Chuck Berry's case, it didn't take much effort because he, he's so well known and, and researched already. But I love the fact that people can walk along, whether they're eight years old or 80 years old, and read a little bit about the person. That's why the informative plaque is there. I also bring out a book and distribute it to all the middle schools and high schools, libraries, and also and, and on the website, too, so people can learn about St. Louis. Uh, and, and people around the world can realize how important St. Louis has been culturally on a national level. They have to have had national influence and uh, that to be on the Walk of Fame. And and uh, and I, I think everybody there's a there are 120 people that vote on the selection committee. Um, I only have one vote, so people can't blame me for whoever gets in or not. But Chuck Berry was the first one inducted out of the, the first class of 10, and now there are over 160 stars and plaques of, of all sorts of famous people um, that came from St. Louis. Yeah, that's great. And and there's also a um... Uh, and now a great statue of Chuck, which is kind of right there, uh, right across from Blueberry Hill, right? And you helped um, kind of it's lead amazing. a fundraising campaign for that, right? It's an amazing statue. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah Harry Weber, who is a great sculptor, the prop, probably the greatest in motion sculptor in the world today, um, meaning that his sculptures really show motion. And, and he did a great job on, on Chuck Berry. And Chuck was really fascinated by the whole process. He and I would drive down to Harry's studio to watch him do a, a clay beginning part, then the bigger part, and then watch the casting and all. He was fascinated by the, the, the progress and the artistry that went into that statue. 
and it's eight feet tall, and it's all on one foot. As he's he's just about to go into the duck walk, you can see it. It's so animated and and, and wonderful, and, and uh, it, it was a glorious day when that was dedicated. And people come and get their pictures taken to this day, year round, day and night. Little kids and they do the duck walk in front of that statue, and and their families photograph them. It, it, it's it's amazing. And the sculptor himself is now in the St. Louis Walk of Fame because he's done in motion sculptors sculptures all around the world, really, not just here Didn't in he St. Louis. Did he the Bush Yeah, he did yeah. a lot of the St. Louis Cardinal baseball yeah. teams, yeah. Uh, um, you know, you know, both Bob Gibson and Luke I hope yeah. he didn't do that big one at Stan Musial. No, like he, that. He, he always says that, that wasn't mine. No, that was a different guy. We actually have a brief clip here of um, Chuck from an oral history interview we did with him, I think back in 2011. Uh, it's with Peter Gralnick uh, conducting the interview. And um, he mentions, talks a little bit about how much he loves St. Louis, but he, there's a little bit of a conversation about the statue, if we can uh, pull that up here. But about, about listening to hearing Hank Williams on a big radio station, and this was in St. Louis, right? Right. And that's, maybe you could just say, they, they want you to say, I grew up in St. Louis. And that's... Yes, from, from nothing, to one, of course, I'm starting out in life, but I didn't move. I still don't. I'm, I'm living in St. Louis. It's home to me. You've been I in St. Louis all your no, life? No, I, I place every other place in, re, in the shadow of St. Louis. St. Louis. Well, I understand St. Louis has a very distinguished statue added to the landscape now. Yeah. A statue, a statue of a very distinguished citizen. Oh, uh, you know, yeah, I haven't <laughs> been up close to it yet. I want to look at it now, and I have to go at midnight. I don't want anybody to see me standing there looking at it. I think I'm kind of voodoo it or something, <laughs> you know. Well, I, I feel like I'm, I'm going to have to make a pilgrimage to there. I, I want to see that statue. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, um, and not only do we have um, that oral history interview with Chuck, uh, but in 2012, the year after that, oh, yeah. uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame hosted a week-long celebration of Chuck Berry and his music, and um, it ended with a star-studded concert on the final night. Um, here's, here's the poster from that, from that concert. Um, and <clears throat> what was great was um, Chuck and the whole family all yes. the band members and Joe all traveled from St. Louis. And that's when I met all of you for the first time. Um, and I was uh, able to pull out a bunch of items from our collection. He, you know, he toured the museum, but also our library and archives. And here he is. I think he's probably looking at a, maybe a Nat King Cole album of 78s that I brought out and some other um, items from our archives. And uh, yeah, it was one of the, one of the greatest, uh, days of my career, I got to say. Um, and you were all there for it. <laughs> well, well, Andy, I can tell you, it's a really, really big deal when my mom comes out. Okay. And that's her in that picture. So, you know, she toured with dad early, early on in the fifties. And it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is too grueling. But when dad told her, that he was going to be one of the American music masters. He's like, well, what does that mean? And so he explained to her, and that, uh, and that, that you know, they're going to have the the show and all. And she she said, oh, I'm, I want to go to that. Yeah, I, I want to go to that. I want to go to that. Speaking yeah. about grueling, those tours were grueling. Oh, like, okay. <laughs> if you had if you had a, a 22 day concert or 22 day tour schedule, you played 21 days and yeah. it was every night in a different country. You know, it's it was. Busy, busy, busy. Yeah. Second mm -hmm. time I went out of the United States. Second tour, that is. I went out of the United States. We did 17 shows in 15 days, I think it was. We started in Moscow, Russia, and we ended on the coast of Africa at the Grand Canara Islands. It was unbelievable. That's the one where the plane almost crashed when we were going to, going to <laughs> Belfast. Oh, was that the 85 mile an hour? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. But oh, well. <laughs> it grueling, but it was a lot of fun. I have to admit, it was an incredible amount of fun. 
Well, the, the last thing I want to mention about our American Music Masters um, experience was the, later that night, um, you know, Chuck actually appeared on stage kind of at the end of the show and did a few songs with the band. Right. And this is at the age of 86 years old, and we have a little clip uh, that we want to show from that performance. Yeah. 86 yeah. years old doing the duck walk. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. I'm only, and, I'm, I'm only 82. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 62 and I can't even. <laughs> and, and for folks who watch this, if you rewind, you make sure you uh, notice that Butch and Jimmy are in that footage. They're right there on stage. It's, it's that Blueberry Hill band, right? Yes. Right. Yes. That's yeah. The Blueberry Hill band. <laughs> well, um, and as I mentioned, you know, I was, I was, uh, happy to have gotten to see the, one of the final shows. It was in May of 2014, um, and it was uh, a really special thing. I, I could maybe just want to see if I, we could talk a little bit about those final shows. And I mean, I know I know things got a little more difficult as his his health got a little worse over time, and um, it was pretty clear that it wasn't going to last forever. Um, could you talk about that? Uh, actually, th believe it or not, this is a photo I took from my seat at Blueberry Hill uh, th that night. It was, yeah, one of the <laughs> one of the greatest things I ever saw. Um, so, um, maybe, could you talk about uh, kind of how that how that came to an end? Um, maybe Joe or or any of you really. Yeah. Well, from my point of view, I noticed that uh, in the last couple of years, his songs got shorter. And he cut the songs off shorter than he, he normally did. And sometimes we'd we'd run out of time or we'd run out of songs for the time that we had left. And we'd play the last song for 15 minutes, you know. <laughs> but it, it, it got pretty rough there at the at the end. Yeah, he, he never he never wanted to stop no. playing. Um, he always wanted to honor our handshake agreement. Um, and by the way, I always paid him cash up front also as an honor, not that he asked me to or require we never had a written contract but out of respect for him him all, all his career i always did that the um when when things got a little touchy as, as his health was was going down a little bit i after one of the concerts in in i guess it was in late fall said um i i once i kind of got him off stage i said well chuck let's pause during the winter time I, I know he didn't want to hear let's stop altogether. So I said, let's just, let's pause because the harsh weather's coming up, sleet, snow and all, let's pick it back up in the spring or think about it at that time. And he, he, he kind of looked relieved like, oh, okay. And he accepted that because it was coming from me. He would never want to let the place down type of thing, but he, he accepted that. And, and that was the last concert. Well, I knew on an earlier concert, I think the one before the last one, was uh, the one I think where he felt he didn't do a good job and he, he played an hour and a half trying to make yeah, up for it. Right. Right. Uh, he, he knew, he knew things weren't going well. Mm -hmm. sure. You're right. Yeah. Well, I can say, you know, um, having seen one of the, one of the later shows of it during, you know, during that last year, it was really uh, still pretty moving because he, um, you know, even if it was rough here and there, there were these moments of just brilliance, of course. And um, either way, the audience was always rooting for him. You know, it was like, um, uh, and I just felt, I felt like, you know, it's kind of this moving thing because we all get older, we all, our bodies change, our minds change, but um, it just felt like a celebration of life. You know, just kind of, this is the way it should be. You want to be around your family and friends as long as you can. And, and uh, it felt that way to me anyway. Well, I really, I really admire him for that because he did that at 86 years old. I can't even, I can't even stand for an hour anymore. You know, it, it's You're great. so right. The fans loved it, and 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 he loved it too. And as like Jimmy said, tried to really make up for any any laxes. Of, 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 but he, his guitar playing still was good, and 
he would yeah. kind of stumble over some lyrics at times, but I, I was still in awe, and the audience was too. And and they were they were happy they were here to see him, and be able to say, yes, I saw Chuck Berry at Blue Bear Hill in St. Louis. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And this was people from all over the world, Andy. It wasn't just the locals or the kids at the universities coming. We had people coming from literally all over the world. You know, now there was a set, there was a portion of them that were in town for business, you know, because we had several four half several Fortune 500 companies. But and then the other portion, another portion that is that were coming to see family. But we had a significant number of people coming specifically to St. Louis, to Blueberry Hill to come to that concert. And it blew my mind. I mean, the people show me the tickets. Yes, I just, I fly in today. I leave tomorrow. I just wanted to see Chuck. Wow. Oh, thank you. I mean, that's that's just incredible. That that still blew, blows my mind. And you know, the thing that, that, that made his music last so long is it's good time music. Yeah. Man. It's, he, he doesn't talk any politics or nothing like that. He's not trying to press an agenda. It's good time music. Yeah. It's fun to listen to. Yeah, I'm still grateful that I was able to to witness it. So, um, and then you know, um, s sadly, um, about two and a half later, two and a half years after the final show in March of 2017, he passed away uh, at the age of 90. Um, but then a few months later, um, this album Chuck came out, right? Um, his yes. final album uh, so far, anyway. Um, released in 2017 in, in June, I think. Yeah, uh, a bunch of new recordings that you'd all been working on for years, right? Oh, long, long time. Yeah, long time. Uh, so the last album prior to that was Rocket, which was released in '79, and then Dad went back into the studio. But I mean, Jimmy can attest to the fact that those guys were out of out of the country constantly or touring are doing the one night constantly. So they were going to the studio. There were several of them over that almost four decades and they would record something and then get back on the road, do some playing and then come back and record something else. And, you know, keep just kept that pace up. And then unfortunately, 89, uh, I'm going back to Barry Park, there was a fire for 60, 70, 100, Ampeg two inch tapes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh gee, great. And and Jimmy tells me, man, there was some unbelievable stuff on on those tapes where uh, it would be him, my dad, and you know just some other. They would just you know be kicking stuff around. And, and Johnny dad, Johnson too. Yeah, and, and my dad would just let the the uh, the uh, two track or the twenty four track run. And sometimes these guys wouldn't even know, and they would just start jamming. And he would come in and play. So this is just just spontaneous stuff, all burned up. They start over. Uh, man, I guess it was 1990. That's when he got that replacement NCI board, and they he just slowly start putting more stuff together until you know uh, after after really it was right after the last show. Then uh, Dad's focus turned. I want to get this last this uh, well in his words. I want to get this next album out. So that was his focus, and he enlisted my mom's help, uh, Joe's help, in fact, all of our help uh, to get that last album released. Yeah, um, and one other uh, album that came out that I want to briefly mention too is the um, in 2021 the album Live from Blueberry Hill came out, and that's um, something that I. Rec recommend to anyone. It really gives you a great sense of the fun and excitement of those shows at Blueberry Hill. Ridiculously fun, just <laughs> senselessly fun. You do get to hear it all. You, <laughs> Jimmy has a distinct laugh. I've got a distinct laugh, and you can tell when my dad has done something. You can hear one or both of us just burst out laughing. In fact, there's one I don't remember which song it is. I, I'm just screaming laughing <laughs> just, it, it's just it was a barrel of laughs it was a barrel of fun and it was just a i mean it was a great time it was i was in the band for 14 years the last 14 years of him uh, performing and every minute of it at blueberry hill was a, just a blast hmm. yeah that's great if and if so if you didn't get a chance to see those shows when they happened this is a great way to experience that or if you did go to the shows, it's still a lot of fun. 
Um, well, as we as we kind of wrap up here, I, I want to mention, as I mentioned earlier, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame opened a new exhibit earlier this year. It's called From School Days to Blueberry Hill, Chuck Berry in St. Louis. And it explores, you know, Chuck's legacy um, and focuses on everything we've been talking today from his early years to his final years in, in the city there in St. Louis. Um, it includes all kinds of things, including, as we can see here, uh, his Gibson ES350T electric guitar, which is now owned by Joe Edwards. Uh, Chuck okay. gifted it to him. Um, and this was played on so many classics in the late 50s. Uh, Joe, do you want to mention the, the guitar, talk about it? Well, when I, when I told Chuck that I was going to expand and redo the front entrance to Blueberry Hill and build a, dis a display case, uh, or several display cases of, of items and all, um, then he said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a guitar to display. And, um, and then it took another few months of construction to actually redo the front of Blueberry Hill. And he said, well, just let me know whenever it's done. So, so I called him one weekday and said, it's done. He said, well, come on out to Berry Park and I'll give you the guitar. So I drove out there. And then when he was walking out I, from the case itself, I realized, oh, my goodness. I think that it's like the guitar, and and um and it sure as heck was. I, I I was astounded by his friendship and that gesture, and that wonderful gift, and and I, I'm also grateful that people from around the world can see it on display at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, right now, and then and they had for years at, at Blueberry Hill. So it, it it was a cool, cool, cool gift from a great friend. Yeah. Um, and we also have the, uh, and as we can see here, his uh, mm -hmm. Fender Dual Showman reverb amp that um, you know he was famous for playing since through the, throughout the '70s. But this one was the one used at all the shows at Blueberry Hill. Yes, it was. It sure was. It, um, after Dad passed away, Mom, you know, we uh, some of the stuff was out at Berry Park, and Mom said, "Well, you know, we won't be out there that much, so." Um, bring some of that stuff in. It's like, okay, well, mom, here's all the guitars. What do you want me to do with them? Uh, mom, here's, and so, so she said, okay, well, we'll put those guitars in, you know, in, in a vault. I was like, well, what about the amp? I think, I don't want that thing in my house. It's too big. You keep it in your house. I'm like, come on, mom, please. I don't want to keep this thing. It's priceless. So it did. It stayed in my house for, um, what, two years, something like that, until you guys called and said, hey, uh, you're putting this, no, in fact, that, that, I think that came up before the exhibit, if I remember right, it was the, uh, the 345 that, that's in the exhibit. <clears throat> so you had the, I guess it had been up there for about a year and you guys were, but you were in the planning of stages, uh -huh. putting everything together. And then uh, I think it was you, Andy, it's like, hey, Butch, uh, uh, how about uh, you, you guys got, you know, we got this this exhibit almost done. Uh, you, you, Think your mind would want it. So, so that other guitar is a an ES three forty five that I bought um, on eBay. It was an auction, and I'm looking at it, and I buy it. I'm, I actually I bought it kind of out of spite. I was like, that's not my day. Why, why would you put that as Chuck Berry's guitar on it? So I buy the guitar, go out to St. Charles, and the guy's like, hey, wait a minute. I know who you are. I've been to see you. At, yeah. No, okay. And so then he's like, well, yeah, your dad wouldn't sign it. So I was like, well, God, I don't want it. He's like, oh, I got it. And so that next show or something like that, I was like, man, and it was, a, it's an excellent guitar. But so next Blueberry Hill show, uh, I was like, dad, somebody wants you to sign it. So I've got, a, I've got other guitars here. It's yours. He's like, what? So he played it that night. He played it several times. And, um, you know, it's another priceless gem to us because, you know, it's, it's something that he, he really liked it. I mean, he picked it up. It's like, man, yeah. and he used the phrase, this thing tastes really good, which is something I hadn't heard before. I don't know, Jimmy, you heard that. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, wow, it tastes good. Well, I understood what he said, but I had never understood. I just had never heard it. But it's like, I understand what you mean because that is an excellent guitar. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you uh, for, for lending it. And I, I should also recognize, especially uh, Butch and Joe, for um, everything you, you've uh, contributed to this exhibit, because it obviously couldn't have happened without, without you. Um, so if, if folks are, are traveling through Cleveland, um, if you can come to the Rock Hall, you, you need to see it. 
uh, includes clothing and handwritten lyrics and rare photos, sheet music, things you've been seeing all along. There's the rock and roll beer that, uh, that Joe <laughs> was talking about. And there's a photo right there of the, uh, of the guitar, the, the ES-345, which is, which is on exhibit as well. And um, posters from Blueberry Hill that Joe contributed and donated. So um, visitors have really been enjoying it. And um, I hope, hope you can all get to Cleveland and see it. Um, but Andy, Andy, Andy one, one bit of clarity. Yeah, the things that Joe contributed, and my mother contributed because that everything up there she loaned, not me. I I I, I would have been quite honored to do it, but no, my mother. That's all her stuff. That, that's up in the hall. She Understood. Loaned. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you to her too. I really appreciate all the support. And um, you know, I guess just for final thoughts here before we wrap up, I want to um, just mention. Um, the latest biography that came out, Chuck Berry and American Life, came out in 2022. It's thoroughly researched, um, really well written. Um, the author, R.J. Smith, did research some of the research for it here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Library and Archives, which is where I am right now. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, Jimmy's book, Memories of Chuck, uh, right here, as you can see, again, filled with great stories about their years working together and their friendship. So check that out, too. Um, too, Andy. I'm sorry. Jimmy's book. That should be at that exhibit too. I'm telling oh. you, from page one to the end, it is the for real deal, and with an extremely humorous twist. Jimmy has more stories than anyone could imagine, and that thing is filled up. Agreed. It's really a fun, a fun read too. So uh, highly recommended to everyone. Um, and I guess, I guess just for my final thought, I wanted to just end by saying um, just something about Chuck. I think, you know, without Chuck Berry um, and the music he created, um, well, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame might not exist. Um, rock and roll may have still existed, but it would be very different. It would be very different without it. It would have been boring. <laughs> it would have been. It would have been. And I think without rock and roll, yeah, we'd all, we would all be different, all of us. Um, so um, I think the world would be a different place if it hadn't been for Chuck Berry and certainly wouldn't be as cool <laughs> or as fun as, as Jimmy just said. So um, I want to thank and acknowledge Chuck Berry for his music and for breaking down the barriers that we talked about, not just musically, but otherwise, and not just in St. Louis, but uh, around the world. And um, I want to thank all of you out there for watching this interview. And of course, I want to thank our wonderful guests. And I, I'd like to see if, if you have anything else you'd like to say before we close out. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, one quick thing, when, when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had its big concert in, in Cleveland, the outdoor stadium with 90,000 people um, before the building itself was built, um, Chuck Berry opened that concert at around six o'clock roughly and and also closed it at 12 or 1 a.m and that's amazing that he could do that at, at that age and everything else and and was willing to and and you all were so receptive to that and it was a great great night yeah it was i was there too it was unbelievable <laughs> absolutely unbelievable well we yeah we couldn't have had that concert without him i don't think i mean you know first inductee um King of rock and roll, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, um, I, so again, I want to thank this um, distinguished group of gentlemen for joining us from the Duck Room at Blueberry Hill in St. Louis. And Joe, thank you again for for uh, hosting from from that great location. You're welcome. Thank you all, and um, yeah, I hope to see all of you in Cleveland. I'll be back in St. Louis and. Um, but thank you for joining virtually today. This was, has been really fun. Sure. Thank I'm you. Glad. Thank you very much. Take care. All right.